I'm a Maisel obsessive. I uh, accidentally wore pink, didn't mean to, but um, I love you on the show. There's you, you, uh, <laughs> you fit right in. I think that uh, it has to be very difficult to jump into a show that is not just established, but is established with a uh, specific style and a specific rhythm. So I guess, um, well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me, but also, I guess that just leads me to my first question. Um, did you feel any pressure to kind of jump into this Amy Sherman Palladino confectiony world, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I certainly did. I um... How do you overcome that? Uh, God, um, oh, variety of ways, really. <laughs> uh, you know, th th there was no external pressure. Uh, right. It was just pressure that I put on myself, you know, and Amy and Dan were fantastic mm -hmm. since the very first day of us, you know, chatting on Zoom. When I joined at the end of season four, it was during pandemic. So, you know, everything was, was Zoom, but it was getting me up to speed on what they wanted to do with the character or, or rather mm -hmm. what they hoped to do with the character down the line. Right. And I had a good amount of time to really catch up on the series. My wife uh, is a massive fan of the show. So after I got off the first call with Amy and Dan, she's like, oh, you're fucking doing it. <laughs> and um, like, I hope you don't fuck yeah, up that audition. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, I I just fell in love as a fan first with their 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 style, their cadence. You know, the real musicality yeah. that Amy and Dan bake in. So I was I was really excited to go. And, and but yes, there was a bit of pressure of like, I really want to hit the ground running and, you know, and slot right in. And and luckily, yeah. between Amy and Dan and, and Rachel and, you know, and everybody, you know, the, yeah. the entire crew, they just were so warm and so welcoming. Mm. You know, I got a, a nice sort of soft entry. It was great. <laughs> Okay. The thing that I like about uh, this season is that we, we get an inkling of the Gordon Ford show world a little bit in season four, but I feel like, which is kind of nuts that they keep doing this, where they just, they just, you know, introduce an entire new section of, of, of you know, people, characters, you know, like Michael Cyril Crichton, love him. Um, you know, all those, all those guys, the writer's room scenes are one of my favorite, but people zipping in and out were really awesome. Um, I did want to ask in episode one, when Susie approaches Gordon about putting Midge on, you say, she's downtown, I play to the cornfield. And I was wondering, as like a, um, a comic as the character, do you think that's hard to reconcile playing to the cornfield? Uh, do you, you mean for for Gordon? Did he have a hard time? You think? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very I'm very curious about yeah. what Gordon's past is and how he like settles into this. Yeah, well, that's I mean that's one of the things that sort of drew me to the character. You know, mm -hmm. we, we sort of came up with this backstory that you didn't really get to to see a whole lot, but it it does it's in there. It gets alluded to, not very specifically, but you can you can connect some dots. I think he comes from very humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. you now he's uh. He, his parents moved to Canada, you know, so he, he, I think he, you know, like many people sort of outside of a big market feels a certain, to a certain extent that he, he's just happy to be there, but he's yeah. worked his way up to the top as well. Um, but I think, you know, he's risen enough through the system to understand that, you know, when you, you know, get to be wear one of the crowns of late night, you are, you're, 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 you're playing to the masses, you know, you've got yeah. to, to a certain extent, roll it down the middle mm -hmm. and please everybody. Mm -hmm. But I think the better late night hosts, which Gordon certainly, you know, tried to, you know, model himself, himself one, but if you look back, you know, through history and the, the characters that I really tried to, to, you know, lean towards, you know, Johnny Carson, Jack Parr, you know, they knew the responsibility of anchoring, yeah a network's you know big flagship program but they also try to sort of push the boundaries a little bit you know nudge something forward socially mm. when they can when it was appropriate right. take some risks when the the mm. the success came along with it and i think so when he sees midge at first he's sort of like yeah she's you know she's fucking funny but yeah 
I, 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 I can't there. sell her to Iowa. You know what I mean? Sell her to Iowa. Right. I get like a real, if to use sort of like a modern reference, I get kind of like a, uh, I'm a big Seth Meyers fan. So I get like a Seth Meyers-y vibe. For yeah. A modern context. I just recently went to New York and attended. It was the first like late night talk show that I ever attended. That is a very specific type of atmosphere. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's sort of, you know, the way like nudging social stuff forward, you know, like Seth Meyers does a lot of, you know, social commentary and stuff on the show. Sure. Oh, he's one of the best. Oh yeah, he's yeah, I love him. Um when I was rewatching a lot of the the episodes again, because you know, I, I just have it on all the time because I'm a loser, but um <laughs> I was wondering if you think that, especially towards the end of the season, if it is hard for Gordon to uh, for lack of a better phrase, not devolve into a giant baby, because um, something that I that I think is really interesting is, you know, that's his world. This is his playground. What he says goes. And Midge entering this world really sort of pushes him out of the way in terms of control a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so I guess I wanted to know um, if you think he that. <laughs> babyness is this is inside him at all the time and uh oh, absolutely is that is that hard to like, push down a little bit oh yeah for one thousand percent you know he he uh this is his sandbox you know that he he built and he doesn't want to share the spotlight certainly mm -hmm. um you know they've got these arbitrary rules that if you work on the show you can't be on the show there are certain you know kind of like I guess, political reasons why one might institute those kind of policies right. just because you don't want to show favoritism. And you, you can blame it on all that. But I think like ultimately what it is, is he doesn't want to get shown up by someone in his own stable, you know? And then when, yeah. when Midge comes along, she does just that. And I feel, I think he feels not threatened that she's going to take the show from him or anything like that, but just sort of like, you know, she might be better than me. She's more current than I am. She's more way more downtown. So she's got her finger on a certain pulse that I don't. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, if she takes a moment away from me, what does that say? Do you, do, does the audience begin to see the cracks? And then on top of that, he just doesn't like being told what to do. So when his wife comes and tells him, you're going to do this for me. And we can yeah. only start to imagine the reasons, you know, why he, you know, quote unquote, owes her or, you know, whatever happened in the past or whatever kind of relationship they have now. Yeah. You know, I think he, he <laughs> resents it. And again, to, like you said, like a baby, he's going to take it out on someone. Maybe he takes that out, takes it out on Midge. Yeah. I love the scenes that you have. I, I'm a big fan of Nina Arianda in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And she, she's amazing. She's, yeah. So she's great. just, there's such a, um, I can tell as a as an audience member, no matter what type of script it is, she's the type of performer who throws back at you. Uh, oh, yeah. And I think it's really interesting in that scene where she says, uh, you owe me, you know this. Um, there is this coy, cat-like thing that she brings. And I feel like he is so unsettled by that. Like, he he's a king in his castle and yet you know his wife comes trotting in whenever she can or wants to and she can just yeah we played around with that like where does that actually come yeah. from because you know he, he says early on uh in the episode the ice skating episode mm -hmm. you know when he first tries to put the moves on midge she says aren't you married and he said ah you know i'm not that kind of married right so you know that he's got some sort of you know arrangement with his wife but what we were playing with it's like it must go deeper than just that so him owing her isn't for her turning a blind eye to the affairs you know i think it goes beyond that i think her you know she comes from a, a powerful erudite family somewhere along the along his rise i think she probably or someone in her family perhaps pulled some strings to help get him the job you know, because he came out and it's in there too that, you know, that, that he, you know, basically was plucked out of, you know, radio and vaudeville yeah. before that. So whatever that debt is, we can only imagine how big it goes, but that's what we sort of like layered it with. So that's really kind of like, 
Yeah. I do. Owe you. I owe you professionally. I don't just owe you personally because mm -hmm. this isn't just a personal favor. This is also a professional favor. And I think he knows what it is. Like, you know, she's, she's letting him know. She's like, I helped make, make you, I could help break you, which also just like, and then all the stuff that that gets into, like the relationship that, you know, any member of a, of a couple would hold that over the other is pretty interesting. Okay. I'd love to see, you know, I, I, I want, I wanted to live in this world for 15 years. I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. I wanted to spend the rest of my life as Gordon Ford. He was so <laughs> just like juicy and delicious. And Nina was fantastic. I, I, I can, I would have loved to explore that relationship even more. Yeah. I love that. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, ambiguity. I think I, I call it gimme culture. I think we, we need to know too much and I don't, I like living in sort of a gray area. So I love that they don't, they don't tell us maybe say, Gordon knows about any different proclivities that Hetty might have. He doesn't know like what, you know, they don't know what each other does maybe on the, the side, but I love that there's like a, there's like a communication between the two of you. That's basically just so, so easy to, that's just like, mm -hmm. you're going to do this, whether, um, whether you like it or not. And you know exactly why. Um, yeah, that kind of storytelling has always interested me too. I I I agree with you. I I I love ending on a question, which I think the show did a phenomenal job of. I mean, it it fills in some. It gives you like a bit of a sort of you know satisfying ending, and that you yeah you know spoiler if you haven't seen it, but you you get to see where where Midge and Susie have ended up. Yeah, a little bit of the stuff that led you along the way via those flashbacks throughout the season, but you know letting the audience fill in all the the points in between i mean i love that i find that more satisfying it's sort of like well i can go off and just it it, it, it makes me stay in that world longer because i yeah i want to answer the questions for myself i walk around for days thinking about like like right now my wife and i are we're obsessed with the great we love it love yeah. the great <laughs> incredible yeah, and I love all the questions it poses, and sort of like, well, what about this, and what about this, and what what happened with this, and why this, and I, yeah. I love it. It's, it's really, to me, that's entertainment because it really stimulates you intellectually beyond the run of the show. Yeah, because I think what the, this final season really smartly did was very early on, it it wasn't necessarily it eliminates the question of how big does Midge get. It sort of mm -hmm. like introduces like here it is she's biggest superstar you can possibly think of but then it sort of fills um sideways out like there's the i think it's the top of episode two where they're talking about how she like bombed at carnegie hall and you just see those pictures of her and i was like what happened i need to know yes. what happened um just sidebar have you finished season three of the great oh yeah oh, oh my god because i i spoke to Elle Fanning last week and it was sort of you did yeah oh. we were both talking about like what what's the show gonna do what are they, what are they gonna yeah. do so yes I, I agree oh, we're freaking out over here we're literally oh, yeah. freaking, it's like like what do we do without this couple in our life yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay yes it's uh I love that I love that shit more more shows and more movies I feel like need to do that um mm -hmm. we're too concerned with um not stimulating people's minds in a different way yeah, uh, I wanted to know if you think uh, Gordon going after Midge, uh, I I don't want to say like is that genuine, but I I feel like I don't know if it had something to do with like control over like his castle. I didn't know if maybe Gordon has ever had to work this hard to maybe try and take a girl out on a date. I I just feel like what we see between Midge and Gordon is unlike anything that he has ever had to encounter before even like putting talent completely aside um so i guess i wanted to know if you think uh if this is his, his hardest conquest that he never gets a hold of i think it's up there yeah, yeah. i really do i think that's why it piques his interest mm. the way it does um you can't have it so therefore you want it more exactly you know the forbidden fruit for sure but also you know it it, it speaks to a culture you know, mm -hmm. the early 1960s is very male dominated culture, especially the world of comedy, mm -hmm. which honestly not much has changed. And I think he thinks, you know, A, I'm the boss, I'm the top dog. 
we are number one as of right now. There is no one bigger than me. Everyone says yes to me right now. Mm. And not by force, but like, don't you want to say yes? Like, come on. Yeah. But I also think he's very intrigued by the cat and mouse of it all. And I think he loves that challenge. You know, she's a very mm. tough nut to crack. And, he, the, you know, the, he, he goes as far as to you know, put a very fine point on. It. He's like, this is, you know, Tracy Hepburn. He yeah. loves it. Mm. He loves it. Um, but it's more than just the fact that, you know, he can't get into her pants. And why not? She's smart. She's funny. Mm. She's tough. She reminds him of himself, I think. Mm. So he's just, he's just fascinated by her. And so I think to answer your question, I think it's very genuine, but then I think it keeps like compounding. It's sort of like, I think it's, it's a genuine attraction. You know, he wants, he, he, he wants her because she's attractive at mm -hmm. first and, and funny and all, and all that. And then it's sort of intriguing to sort of like, oh, wow, why can't I get her? And then the more he knows her, he's sort of like, wow, we really are like, come on, well like, suited in, in a, in a parallel happen. universe. We are very well suited for one another. Yeah. There's, there's something about the, the transparency that I found very refreshing. It's not like it's not not like that, but I mean, like you know, it's sort of just like, come on, like you know, if it's not like he's 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 hunting down somebody um, because he doesn't think that she can intellectually handle it. It's just there's something about the way that he uses the acknowledgement of their chemistry as sort of like a tactic that I think yeah. is this the oh. so. Uh, he lays it bare. He tells her that oh, he's yeah, coming. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he just, he's like, I'm not going to let up. I'm not going to let like, up. Yeah, here are he my cards. Take them. <laughs> every angle, every angle, until finally he realizes, you know, all right, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Let's see where we go from here. But at that point, that's when the break comes. That's when, you know, Hetty forces him to do this thing. And it's sort of like, wait a second, not only did I not get, I, get what I want, but now I have to elevate her. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that doesn't doesn't sit too well with Gordon. Yeah, I gotta say the last ten minutes of that series finale, the tension in that episode. That episode is like ferociously directed. And uh, Amy Sherman Palladino. Oh She's man, amazing. she she somehow makes it like she is able to create tension like that. But it's also the way she moves the camera is really romantic and cinematic. It's kind of oh, yeah. how she can. It's a dance. You know, she's, oh, she, she was a dancer. So yeah. everything has this baked in choreography, this musicality to it. And mm -hmm. you feed off of it. Yeah. And it, it, it's obvious from the top down, the crew feeds off of it. The cast feeds off of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it creates a really, amazing very unique environment in which to work and on a day like that last day you know, i've you know to be there for the very end it was very you know emotional frenetic you could feel it everyone was sort of like you know crackling with this energy because you knew it was coming we all read the script we all knew that that moment was coming mm -hmm. where you know i'm gonna I'm going to say these words and we're going to know why she has this name. And then Amy's going to yell cut and that's going to be it. We're mm -hmm. going to be done. Oh. And it was, it was electric, but man, it was, it, it was, it was beautiful. Everyone was assembled. The entire cast was there. It was really, yeah. really special moment. I just feel lucky that I got to be a part of it. Yeah. I, sp I had the pleasure of speaking to, uh, Marin and Michael and, uh, Tom Miser wants me to ask you if you can sing. Um, <laughs> nah. were, yeah. Nah. Depends on what it is. Depends okay. on what it is. I'll let yeah. him know. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dirty can... blues, sure. <laughs> I can get down with that, but yeah. Yeah, there's something about that episode. It's just, I, I can feel the chemistry. Like, you know, it's cliche, but you can feel it coming from the screen. You can really, yeah. really you do. And uh, I think it's rare that a show delivers on the promise of its characters like this has um it was a very warm environment it's really unusual i mean like yeah uh, veep was very similar we were fast friends from the very beginning mm -hmm. and i think that's why we had the chemistry that we did because we all we genuinely like to just be around each other and you're spending yeah. a yeah. lot of time together when you're working on a television series especially one like veep that mm -hmm. required a lot of um 
you know, extracurricular yeah. effort, yeah. a lot of late night rehearsals, weeks of rehearsals, weekends of rehearsals. And you got to love the people that you're around. And the only other show that I can really say came close to that environment was, was Maisel yeah. in that everyone genuinely wow. loved each other and, you know, um, and, and cared for one another. You really got this sense of sort of yeah. like, everyone's got my back. You know, you're, you're working with, with tough material. You're delivering a certain, you know, style of performance and a, and a speed and it's got to be word perfect. And mm -hmm. everyone knows it's sort of, we're in this pressure cooker that, you know, Amy and Dan really demand perfection from the crew yeah. and from the cast and from everybody. And it makes everyone really want to deliver. And there really was this team sensibility of like, I've got you, I've got mm -hmm. you go ahead and fuck up the line, do it again. I got you every single time, you know, you were face to face with your scene partner, you knew you were in good hands from the top down. It really was a, yeah. just a wonderful working environment. Mm -hmm. And both of those shows, Veep and Maisel, they could not be any, any more different, but like, you know, yeah. or the words are so important on both of those shows and, uh, different skill sets completely. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, I can just, I get this, like, I, I say it all the time, like, acting troupe vibe. I don't know. It's, I can mm -hmm. feel that from the actors. Like, and you would be able to feel that if, if it wasn't like that. I, I really, you know, if you could tell that the rhythm between the actors was off or, you know, they didn't have each other's back like that, you would be able to feel that as an audience member. And I, I agree. I yeah. Don't think you always like, can. You yeah, always yeah. can. You yeah, see a movie, cool. you see a play, you see anything where it's sort of like, ah, eh, something's yeah, off. Like that doesn't work. No. <laughs> yeah. That's Whatever they're, they're not they're not enjoying themselves or each other or something is off yeah and the moments fall flat but then you can see someone else you know and, and the material might be great but if there's something amiss between the actors or maybe it's their dynamic with the director or, or yeah. whatever you can just sort of tell but then if that chemistry is there that chemistry can elevate something from you know a b to an a just by virtue of it being so powerful and electric between those two performers or however they're being directed by the director but you you can you can tell when you know an actor is happy <laughs> to be there and you can tell yeah. when yeah. one's not <laughs> okay uh, i guess just one last question before i let you go i like how in the finale we do see gordon laughing during midge's set because mm -hmm. obviously She's conquering the world in that moment. I wondered, and this may sound negative, but do you think Gordon invited Midge to the couch in some way to maybe like say that he was there when she was discovered? Or maybe to say, yes, like, you know, to, to be like, <laughs> I discovered Midge. Look, I put her on my show. For sure. For sure. I think he's he's genuinely impressed by her. He's not dumb. I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, God. I mean, like, yeah. you gotta make a moment out of it. But I think it's also genuine. You know, I, yeah, I, I think he's like, he's, he's like he's like wow. She just brought the house down, myself mm -hmm. included. I think he's legitimately blown away by her level of talent and her guts and her bravery and mm -hmm. and, and and all of it. Her strength as a woman to stand up there and take her moment not be given her moment if anything but you know she has not been given anything so she takes her moment and i think he's really impressed by that in the end so part of it is you know congratulations part of it is like he's like he says you know where did that come from i think he's genuinely curious it's mm -hmm. like how did you do that that was fucking phenomenal what you just did yeah. and then of course he's got to own the moment making her first but not her last appearance on the yeah. Gordon Ford show. Yeah, he's going to put his stamp on it however he can. That's the kind of guy he is. That's mm. that's entertainment right there. That's that's the business. Yeah. yeah. It made me think of like, you know, like when talk show hosts are like, "Hey, and coming up this week, we have so and so coming back onto the show." I can I could I instantly thought of Gordon Ford being like, "Remember when she was here and made her oh, Yeah. Did, you saw her here back. first, folks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there was a DJ. There was a, a radio station here in, in Los Angeles years ago uh, that's gone now. It was my my favorite radio station. And there was a, a DJ who was just fantastic guy. I mean, like, and, and played incredible stuff. And really, yeah. I think, played a huge part in 
broadening people's musical horizons in Los Angeles. And <laughs> it was, I don't know what happened. He was pissed off one day. And he just went on this litany of all the bands that he played first. And he's like, these guys played him first, played him first, played these guys first, played these guys first. And just like, and like, and now they're on this station and this station, this station. And I think we all feel like that. You know, we all have that, that band sort of like, well, I like the early stuff, Yeah. you know, or I saw that when I was, you know, oh, you like that movie? I saw it when I was five, you know, making, taking ownership of the, the origin of something. So that's what, that's what he did. Yeah. We all do that. You yeah, see, you, see, you see it in like film Twitter. It was like, oh, you like that movie? I saw it in Toronto. Just sort of totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I saw that in previews. It's like, okay, oh. yeah. Oh, oh, you caught it. How Good nice. For you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you, Reed, for your time. I was so excited to. Uh, I I had to talk to you for the show. I think you're so great. Thank uh, you. Season, you're welcome. And I and I was so happy to see you. Uh, you know such a big part so i'm really rooting for you to get nominated for this and uh yeah just thank you so much for your time i think it's just really great solid work thanks joy appreciate it man yeah no problem all right have a good rest of your day thanks bye you too